at this point in the War of the Five Kings, it seemed that the Lannisters were surrounded by enemies on all sides and were about to be crushed, with Robb Stark winning impressive victories and Stannis Baratheon marching on the capital. But Tywin Lannister was ever resourceful, and even in this seemingly desperate situation was looking for ways to improve his position. Still, the battle for King's Landing that would later be known as the Battle of Blackwater was about to start, and defeat in that battle could have ended even the most genius of Tywin's machinations. The fate of his family now rested upon the shoulders of his hated son, Tyrion. In a realm at war, gathering good bannermen and sticking together is essential, so these squabbling lords could probably have used a nice private space to organize themselves online. Well, our sponsor Squarespace will give you something they lacked. They've added a way to make a gated, members-only portal online to build a group in a way that's both easy and private, relying more on photons and less on birds with notes tied to them. The portal allows you to manage your members, do bulk emailing, get audience insights, and generate revenue through the content your site offers. Once people are in, you can use it like a blog or social network. There's a fully integrated comment system with threads, replies, and likes, allowing engagement with your main content or with blogs you can create with powerful internal tools. You can cross posts between your community and other social media profiles in both directions, so you can let everyone know who's killing who in real time. If you need higher level features for your domain, you can use Squarespace extensions, third-party tools that let you also manage inventory, marketing, bookkeeping, tax, and shipping from within the same system, no backstabbing vassals required. The best way to start is by using our special offer. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash wizardsandwarriors to save 10% off your first website or domain. In the aftermath of the victories at the battles of the Fords and Crag, the Starks and Tullys were celebrating and planning their next moves. But events transpiring to the south would change their outlook very soon. Tywin had, at this stage, received word that Stannis had taken Storm's End, and was now marching and sailing his swollen army towards King's Landing. This necessitated a course correction from the Lannister Patriarch. He left a small force under Gregor Clegane to continue harassing the Riverlands, and turned southeast on a forced march towards the headwaters of the Blackwater Rush. There he met the Lords Tarly and Rowan, agreeing to an alliance between the Lannisters and Tyrells, which changed the balance of power. Stannis Baratheon didn't know about this alliance, and was marching northeast towards King's Landing, hoping to take the capital and the throne. However, this would prove to be less simple in practice than it was in theory. The son of Tywin Lannister, Tyrion, was appointed the Hand of King Joffrey. He had inherited all of the guile and intelligence from his father, and made what preparations he could to defend the city. In order to prevent any defections, false rumours were spread, claiming that Stannis intended to raise the Great Sept of Baelor to the ground, as a sacrifice to his new deity, Rolor. Likewise, stockpiles of wildfire were secured for the siege, and the Vale Mountain clans were sent out to harass and harry Stannis' advance. The number of the city guard, gold cloaks, was increased threefold, artillery was constructed, and sellswords were hired for the defense of the city. Most importantly of all, however, Tyrion ordered the construction of a great chain boom across the mouth of the Blackwater. The total garrison of King's Landing amounted to seven to 8,000 men, with the primary contingent being 5,700 gold cloaks, supplemented by 800 sellswords, 300 knights, squires and men-at-arms, hundreds of engineers manning ballistae, scorpions and catapults, alongside contingents of House Stokeworth and Rosby, while the navy consisted of a paltry 45 war galleys, complemented by vessels requisitioned from traders, and what was described to be a swarm of hulks, skiffs, ferries and barges. Tyrion also had 150 or so members of the mountain clans, which were his personal allies, and he sent them towards Stannis to harass his forces. By way of comparison, Stannis commanded a force of 16,400 cavalrymen, primarily hailing from the Reach, as well as contingents from the Stormlands and Crownlands. He had also embarked some 4,600 infantrymen upon his ships, who were primarily raised from the Crownlands, Lys and Mir on 200 ships, with 60 war galleys, 
40 smaller Moorish war galleys, 80 carracks and lumbering great cogs, as well as 25 Luceni pirate galleys under the command of Salador San. At the urging of Sir Davos Seaworth, Lady Melisandre was left behind, in order to ensure the victory was deemed to be Stannis's and Stannis's alone. Despite the attempts of the mountain clans of the Vale, who utilized scorched earth and hit and run tactics in order to slow the advance of Stannis's warriors, the former Lord of Dragonstone duly arrived before the Lannister Tyrell host. The Baratheon host countered the threat posed to their baggage train by setting the Kingswood alight, effectively smoking out their harasses. So began the largest and most decisive battle of the War of the Five Kings, the Battle of the Blackwater. Stannis's vanguard of 5,000 men, consisting of houses Fossaway, Estamont and Florent, under the command of Sir Guyard Morrigan, arrived early and a number of Joffrey's war galleys met them head on, exchanging arrow fire between them. The remainder of the fleet was delayed by the treacherous water and terrible weather conditions, causing the loss of a dozen ships. Overall command of the fleet was granted to Sir Imri Florent, who took up his position on Stannis's flagship Fury while Stannis commanded the host on the south side of the Blackwater, ordering the creation of rafts and also arrows. The battle began properly when Sir Imre Florent ordered the fleet upriver in order to engage Joffrey's ships, entering the visual range of the city by late afternoon. Stannis's commanders were overconfident due to their superior numbers, scouts were not sent ahead, and the entire navy moved forward with the exception of Salador San's Lucini galleys who were kept as a rearguard in Blackwater Bay. Florent organized the ships into 10 battle lines of 20 ships each, the first three composed of war galleys belonging to the Royal Navy and Lords of the Narrow Sea. The Mirish ships behind them were tasked with landing their embarked soldiers to attack the city before joining the first three lines, while the far slower and smaller sailed ships were to ferry the remainder of Stannis's soldiers. As they continued their approach, Sir Davos noticed the newly constructed watchtowers and the chain in the water, but at this stage it was too late, and the ships continued forward irrespective of the imminent danger they now faced. Trebuchets on the city walls began to hurl stones at the oncoming fleet, while pots of pitch were also flung at them. It is at this stage Tyrion's plan to save the city came to the fore. A number of Joffrey's ships had been filled with wildfire, and as Stannis's fleet was lured into its doom, they imploded, setting the ships and the river itself aflame, as the wildfire continued to burn even on the water. To the horror of Stannis's commanders, they realized they were now trapped within the torrent of heat and flame, as the chain had been drawn up behind them. The casualties were substantial. However, the first two battle lines were well upstream of the roiling inferno which had emerged behind them when the hulks bearing the wildfire passed by them. Between 30 and 40 galleys escaped the initial blast, with eight landing under the city walls, allowing their men to make it to dry land. Likewise, the mere men were able to escape with their lives by sailing for the south bank. Within the walls of the city, Tyrion Lannister took charge of the defences, However, the first threat he faced came from within the walls, as some drunkards in Flea Bottom began looting and Lord Jocelyn Bywater sent some of the gold cloaks tasked with defending the city to deal with them. Tyrion then organized sortie parties of mounted men-at-arms and the minuscule number of knights he had available to him under the command of Sandor Clegane and Sir Balan Swan to harass the disembarking soldiers of the besieging host. This was initially successful in holding back the onslaught of Stannis's superior force, the casualties however were grievous. Tyrion learned of a further complication, with Stannis's men successfully landing upon the tawny ground and now preparing to ram the King's Gate. He made his way to the King's Gate, where Sandor Clegane had already led three sorties. The knight, who was visibly spooked and drained of his courage by the wildfire now embroiling the battlefield, refused to venture out again. Those gathered at the mud gate, seeing the warrior who towered above, faltering, started losing heart. Tyrion recognized this, and seeing that desertion could be imminent, elected to lead the next sortie himself. The fact that one with such a short stature was willing to fight, shamed many of the defenders gathered there, and they found courage to join their hand. Chroniclers would later write, that shamed them well enough, 
a knight mounted, helmetless, and rode to join the others. A pair of swords followed, then more. The king's gate shuddered again. In a few moments, the size of Tyrion's command had doubled. He had them trapped. If I fight, they must do the same, or they are less than dwarfs. While Tyrion made his way out to disperse the attackers, the mud gate fell under attack. Fearing for the safety of her son Joffrey, who was commanding the soldiers nearby, Queen Mother Cersei ordered him to be brought to the Red Keep. Before he left, the king ordered members of his Kingsguard, Mandon Moore and Boris Blunt, to assist Tyrion. Still, the king's departure destroyed the morale of the defenders there, who deserted en masse, slaughtering their commanders, among them Sir Jaslyn Bywater. Tyrion proved more successful, however, driving off the attackers at the King's Gate before wheeling around and making his way towards the Lost Mud Gate. At this point, Sir Balin Swan alerted the acting hand to a less than ideal situation developing on the river. The galleys, of which their commanders had lost control, had smashed into one another, creating a bridge of sorts, which allowed the boldest among Stannis's ranks to cross the river, joining the fray on the part of their lord. Sensing imminent danger once more, Tyrion, alongside his sortie party, made their way out onto the bridge in order to halt their opponent's advance. The bridge was quickly breaking up, however, and Tyrion turned to retreat from the tenuous ground. However, at this point, he was betrayed and attacked by Sir Mandon Moore, who was possibly ordered to do so by Joffrey, who hated his uncle. Before he could slay the Hand of the King outright, however, Sir Mandon was himself killed by Tyrion's squire, Podrick Payne. The bridge was now breaking, and as the defenders thought that Tyrion was slain in the fighting, they retreated behind the city walls. Their resistance continued here for a few hours, but it was soon clear that Stannis' troops were going to enter the city soon. Fortunately for the defenders, soon they noticed that some kind of commotion was happening behind the enemy lines, almost as if they were fighting among themselves. That was actually the relief force of between 20 and 50,000 Tyrells and Lannister soldiers. Tywin had arrived just in time to save the city and his family. Moving from their initial position on the Blackwater Rush, the Lannister host had force marched to Tumblr's Falls, where they joined with Lord Mace Tyrell's larger army and made use of the fleet of barges he had in place. Together, they made their way downstream before embarking a half-day's ride from the capital and arriving at the battle around dusk, crashing into Stannis's rear and taking the otherwise meticulous commander unawares. Lord Tywin took command of the right wing on the river's north side. Randall Tarly held the center, with Mace Tyrell commanding from the left. The greatest shock of the day came in the form of the spectre of Renly Baratheon, come to take his revenge on his brother for his assassination. Garland Tyrell, wearing the easily recognizable armor of the fallen king, cut a bloody swathe through the dismayed Baratheon lines at the head of the vanguard causing many more to defect to the Lannister side, believing their liege had returned. Sir Garland then slayed Sir Goyard Morrigan, who commanded Stannis's van, causing further chaos among his ranks. According to the chronicles, they plunged through Stannis like a lance through a pumpkin, every man of them howling like some demon in steel. And do you know who led the vanguard? Do you? Do you? Do you? It was Lord Renly. Lord Renly in his green armor, with the fires shimmering off his golden antlers, Lord Renly with his tall spear in hand. They say he killed Sir Goyard Morrigan himself in single combat, and a dozen other great knights as well. It was Renly, it was Renly, it was Renly. Oh, the banners, darling Sansa. Oh, to be a knight. Salador San, seeing how the tides were turning, put his ships ashore, taking as many survivors as he could fit, while Roland Storm fought a desperate rearguard action, allowing for Stannis and some of his remaining soldiers to board the galleys with at least half of the remaining loyalists being Florence. Due to the limited capacity of the galleys for soldiers to embark, thousands were left behind, and they began to turn on one another in an attempt to save their own lives. Stannis was left with a bare fraction of the soldiers he had brought with him due to defections and casualties, with his only remaining ships being those belonging to the Sellsword Sun as they retreated back towards Dragonstone. 
The garrison also suffered much in the way of casualties, with 1,600 gold cloaks either killed in the fighting or having deserted, alongside the majority of the sellswords, knights and men-at-arms having been killed. However, the relief force suffered only minimum casualties in the ensuing chaos they caused. The victory was simultaneously a decisive victory for the Lannister Tyrell alliance, as well as a devastating blow to all others who claimed the Iron Throne. Joffrey, at the behest of the High Septon, set aside his betrothal to Sansa Stark, instead taking Marjorie Tyrell as his bride, cementing their alliance and immediately making the Lannisters the most powerful force in the realm, easily outnumbering the forces Robb Stark could bring to bear. While Tywin Lannister, relieved of much of the pressure he had previously been under in Harrenhal, took up the role of Hand of the King proper. He was further proclaimed Saviour of the City, setting himself up in a position as the true strength behind the crown, and setting out to bring the conflict to a swift conclusion. While Tywin enjoyed the adulation of the people of King's Landing, a small few would recognize the telling role the now grievously injured Tyrion had played in saving the city. However, the youngest of the Lannister siblings stewed in his anger and resentment, a concoction of emotion which was to have devastating consequences for his family. My hirelings betray me, my friends are scourged and shamed, and I lie here rotting. I thought I won the bloody battle. Is this what triumph tastes like? The situation the Starks found themselves in was bad, but it was about to get much worse, as we will see in our future videos in our series, which will be released soon. We are planning to cover the battles of many other fantasy, sci-fi and space opera universes, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Please consider liking and sharing, as it helps immensely, and don't forget to comment. We'll try to read and respond to every comment as we want to know what you think about this video and which videos you hope to see in the future. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel and we'll catch you on the next one.